Let's turn into our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, a book that I have never, ever preached from. Now, I've quoted from it, from particularly one passage, the old song by the birds. In every season, there's a time, 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 right? Some of you are thinking, what? See, you're too young to understand. Back in the 60s and 70s, so anyway, that joke went over well, didn't it? <clears throat> Life is full of these things. We're going to talk about that today. Ecclesiastes is one of the five Jewish megillos or scrolls that are read on special occasions on, in the synagogue. For example, Esther is read at Purim. Song of Songs is read at Passover. Ruth is read at Pentecost. Lamentations is read at Tishbeav, or the Ninth of Av, or the, the uh, memorialism of the uh, uh, destruction of the t two temples, Solomon's and Zerubbabel's. But Ecclesiastes is read at Tabernacles. And the reason why it's read at Tabernacles is that it speaks of the harvest, the last harvest of the year. When all the money and everything and all your work you've done, everything comes to accumulation and, and there's judgment, so to speak, upon your works. And so it's read in the synagogues to teach the people, the Jewish people, that we ought to live for that day. We ought to live for the judgment of God, live for a life that all we have done is to bring honor and glory to him and also to receive the bounty of his, of his harvest. I personally struggled with choosing the book of Ecclesiastes for several months, if not a year. But let me assure you that God gave me an answer to my concern, and his answer was found in 2 Timothy 3.16, which says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And if you underline anything, I always underline things about, I underline the word all, because all scripture from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 to Revelation 22, 21, it is the word of God. So we're going to go through this book, this book of Ecclesiastes, verse by verse and chapter by chapter to see how it's going to speak to our hearts. I've entitled this series, the book of Ecclesiastes, How to Live a Christ-Filled Life in the Last Days. Now, last days is a two-headed coin in the aspect on one side of the coin. It speaks of prophecy of the last days, and I do believe we're living in the last days. But also on the other side of the coin, it speaks to each and every one of us that number our days, because we are in our last days. I tell you, you know, many of us who are older, we think, well, we're pretty close to the last day, our days here, you know. But then, you know, my very first funeral I ever, ever conducted was that of a stillborn baby. So death comes at all times, so we don't know when our last days are. So we ought to live life as if we are in our last days. The book of Ecclesiastes concerns the matters of the temporal versus the timeless. The, the, uh, uh, also the earthly versus the eternal. It is a book of warning, but it also is a book of wisdom. One commentator said it this way, how, how would I summarize the book of Ecclesiastes in one word? He said, I would not use the word pessimism. He said, I would not use the word optimism. <laughs> he said, I would use the word realistic. Because Solomon speaks of the realism of life. It is here and a moment is gone. All that we accumulate is left behind. Yes, it can be pessimistic. I don't find too many optimistic things in, in the book of Ecclesiastes except the fact that it is realistic and we ought to live our lives for God. So let's read our text today. We're going to cover three verses. We're going to fly through this, I'm telling you. 
Look at verse 1. The Bible says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit as a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? We're going to see two things today. We're going to see his biological, Solomon's biological, or excuse me, his biographical testimony concerning his background. And we're going to see his biblical theme concerning his book. So in verse 1, we see his biographical background. He tells us three things about himself. First of all, he says this is the words of the preacher. This is Solomon's purposeful position. That word pe preacher is where we get the, the name Ecclesiastes because that's the Greek version of the Septuagint. Ecclesiastes means preacher. Now what a preacher did in Solomon's days is that he would sit in front of a group of people, he would bring them in, and he would teach them. See, this is pre synagogue days. This is pre-rabbi days. And so this preacher would bring people into his, his, uh, uh, his palace and he would teach them. He would teach them. The Hebrew word is koalet, which again means preacher. And it is based, this title is based upon his acquirement. You see, it was God's divine endowment. God gives us the ability to share the good news with other people. God gives us, Jesus said, I want you to, told the apostles, I want you to go into the sea of Jerusalem and wait because the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. We all have the Holy Spirit as Christians within us. So therefore, we are endowed with the ability to share the good news. 2 Peter 1.21 says, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but by holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Solomon here, in writing the book of Ecclesiastes, is moved by the Holy Spirit, which proves he has a confirmed faith. Though he has gone into sin, though he has, his life has gone away from what God has chose for him, lo and behold, we see his faith is still confirmed by his writing of his last book in the Bible. We see Solomon's conferred favor. Keep your ribbon here in Ecclesiastes and turn back to the left to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings is right before 2 Kings. That helps you right after 2 Samuel. So if you hit 2 Samuel, you've gone too far. 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth and righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you, you have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go on or to, uh, to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous, numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing and have not asked for long life for yourself, or have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like before you, or shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you and among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Good, good, interesting, and complete advice of God to Solomon. God conferred favor upon him in his early life. 
So we see his, his position was based upon his acquirement as a preacher. He's based upon his authorship, God's divine enlightenment. Solomon was given divine inspiration. All of God's word is divine inspiration, folks. And Solomon was also given devotional insights. God had given him a great wisdom, and there was no one like him. He wrote the Song of Songs early in his life as a young husband, infatuated with the romance of his wife. The Jewish commentators believe that this was not just that advice, but rather it was also a commentary of God's love for Israel. There are many Christian commentaries that also state that the Song of Solomon is a picture of Jesus' love for the church. And then Solomon wrote the Proverbs as a father and an instructor of righteousness for children. My mother found it very helpful. She would leave me scripture on the table after she would go to work. I'd find the Bible opened up, read this proverb. Read this proverb. She always had these things for me to read. Proverbs was a very instructional part of the Bible. It was to bring... It was a compliment against worldly wisdom and brought spiritual wisdom to the children. And then he wrote Ecclesiastes as an elderly man, imparting his regrets of living a life under the sun. There are two lives we can live, folks. The book of Ecclesiastes is going to show us that. A life under the sun and a life above the sun. Solomon's personal pedigree, he said in verse 1, I am the son of David. David was a very famous father. He was the son of Jesse. He was the shepherd of the Psalms. Everybody knew because all the Psalms that were sang there in, in, in the, the time of David were written by David. The sovereign of the people. There was no king like David. There were three kings of all of Israel, the united monarchy of Israel. Only three kings. Saul, who was deposed by God. David, and then Solomon. You see that Solomon was never a David. David was a man after God's own heart. Solomon had become a man of the world, a life lived under the sun. Romans 6, 12 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Solomon had forgotten that principle that God had shared with him there in 1 Kings. Life beginning versus life ending is a very important matter. I believe God would prefer that we start out bad and end up good rather than starting out good and ending up bad. Romans, the seventh chapter, Paul talks about the battle of the old man. That is a battle that, that goes on with Christians. The battle between the flesh and between the spirit. I call it the battle of the dominant will. Which will is going to be more important to you? God's will or your will? Oh, we see the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son said, I want my will over the fathers and went off into his own thing and lived righteously and ended up in the pig pen. But he came to his, his senses, the Bible says, and came home. We see here that Solomon was a man who started out great, but end up sad. We see his famous father, his also faithful father. He was a man after God. David was a man who lived for God. Acts chapter 13, verse 22, And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. What a testimony. A man after my own heart. Again, Solomon was no David. David was a man unlike any other man that God knew and God loved. We see he was also a man who was a flesh. David was a man who also fell, also fell into sin. We all know the story of Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, her husband. We know the story of David's adulterous affair with Bathsheba and his murderous intrigue against Uriah the Hittite. We also know the story of Nathan the prophet who came to accuse David publicly and David's heart was basically turned into sadness 
And there he chose to repent. And there he chose to come back to God. In Psalm 51, starting with verse 7, he says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. David, after his sin, came to confession, came to repentance, and came to God, but his life was never the same. Solomon had regrets, but did Solomon have repentance? His talents had been misused, his focus had become pagan, and his life had become fruitless and wanton under the sun. We see Solomon's personal pedigree. And then there was Solomon's professional prestige. He said, I'm king in Jerusalem. Not only was he the son of David, not only was he the preacher, but he was also the king in Jerusalem. There was no one in the worldly realms higher than he. Monarchs came from all over the surrounding world to see the glories of the kingdom of Solomon. Queen, Queen Sheba came, Queen of Sheba came and said, I've seen the things of Solomon, the half has not been told. Solomon had acquired all the wealth that man could find. He acquired all the power, all the prestige that could be found. But did that make him happy? He was a wise monarch in the beginning, a wisdom delegated by God the Sovereign. As we read in 1 Kings, God said, what do you want? What a, what a blank check to give someone. But here was a man who was the son of David. God expected more of him than he expected of anybody else. You had a father who followed me with his own heart. And Solomon said, Lord, give me wisdom to rule. But he said he took that wisdom and he took that, those money and, that, and all the things that he got and he chose to follow the things of this world. A wisdom dissipated by godless sin. Sin can cause great problems in our lives. It can make us to do foolish choices. His sin led to the dividing of the nation and its eventual diaspora, 70 years in captivity in Babylon. What was Solomon's sin? Was it money? No. Was it fame? No. Was it wisdom? No. His sin was idolatry. He married all these foreign wives and allowed them to bring their foreign gods rather than leading them to the Lord. He let them lead him away from the Lord. 1 Kings 11.10 says, And had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Solomon had lived in a time of sadness. Not only was he a wise monarch that became foolish, but he was also a wealthy man who became poor. A man who was truly blessed by God. Deuteronomy the 8th chapter says, Then you say in your heart, My power and might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. You see, one of the problems of wealth is suddenly we become thinking, well, hey, I did this. And that's what Solomon began thinking. Hey, I did this. I'm the wisest man in the world. I accomplished all of this. I made all the right decisions. I opened all the right doors. I went to the right investments. I did this and did that. But in reality, it was God who gave it to him. He had forgotten. He was a man truly blessed by God, but he was a man truly blinded by gold. He exchanged his checkbook for his Bible. Psalm 119, 127, it says, Therefore I love your commandments more than gold. Yes, than fine gold. You see, Solomon forgot the teachings of the Psalms. There were things that were more important to him 
than God's love. There were things who became more important to him than God's will. So we see not only was he a wealthy man, but he was a woeful man. Spurgeon, who was a great preacher in the 1800s, explained it this way. He said it was the slippery, downward slope of sin. As you begin into sin, folks, suddenly it, it doesn't seem bad. Did you see the other day on television where they showed a woman who was walking her dog looking for glass that had come up on the beach and was walking along and suddenly she thought it was gravel, but in reality was just nothing but mud and she went down to her knees in the mud. They had to bring people out with boards and ladders and everything to get her out. You see, what seems to be stable land, what seems to be a stable path, can be a miry path of slippery slope of downwardness into sin. We see the plenty of the Savior's benevolence. You see, there is mercy in God's love and forgiveness. David found that. Psalm 51, verse 1 and 2, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. You see, David understood that he had a forgiving God. Now that doesn't give us a blank check to go and willy-nilly around our life and do what we want to do. But rather, when we do fall into sin, and beloved, the Bible says, if we say we are without sin, we call God a liar. So when we fall into sin, rather than rolling around and wallowing in the puddle, we get up and ask God's forgiveness. We confess, we repent, and ask God for his forgiveness. We see the poverty of his sinful behavior. Again, back in 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11, starting with verse 9. 1 Kings chapter 11, starting with verse 9. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. God literally appeared to Solomon twice and had commanded him concerning the things that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. What we see here is God has now told Solomon, you're going to lose your kingdom. I'm going to cut it in half. Ten of the tribes went north and formed the nation of Israel. Two of the tribes went south, remained south, and had the, the nation of Judah. We see the tragedy of sin in the life of Solomon, the poverty of his sinful behavior. Now let's look in verse 2 and 3 at his biblical theme concerning Solomon's book. Starts out pretty pessimistic. Doesn't start out with a bluebird of happiness, does it? Verse 2, the Bible says, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I've been quoting that to my wife this week. and She told me the other day, shut up. <laughs> all is vanity. You know, why is this going on? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And finally, she got tired of hearing it. Folks, what we have to understand is this world is full of vanity. The NIV puts it this way. The NIV says it's meaningless. There are people whose lives are meaningless. You can die at 99 years old, and what will that do for you if you do nothing but live under the sun? We see the, the, the uh, Tree of Life version follows along the Jewish versions which use the word futile. Futility, futility, all is futile. 
All we do, folks, under the sun will one day be gone. Life below the sun, life is short compared to eternity. It is fleeting. Life is not long enough to accomplish all the things we want to accomplish and have all the objectives we want to make. We're all going to lay there upon our deathbed one day with regrets. I remember the last of the time when I spoke with my dad, the last time I did the conversation we had and some of the tragedies, some of the sadness that we shared. Life is not long enough to accomplish futile objectives. Therefore, we need to strive to accomplish deeds with eternity in mind, with life above the sun. James chapter 4, verse 13 and 14 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. He had a life he lived below the sun. And then there's life burdened by sin. We live in a world that's saturated with sickness and in sorrow. A world saturated with despair and disappointments. A world saturated with fruitless endeavors and failures of life. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. There are two types of sins. The sin of commission, the things that we do that are wrong, and we know they're wrong, that we commit. But there's also sins of omissions, things that we should do that we do not do. So we see the temporal endeavors of humanity, the temporal versus the timeless, the timeless endowments of heaven. There is a legacy beyond the sun, a life with God throughout all eternity. We need to live for that. Solomon is going to teach us in this book of Ecclesiastes that everything under the sun is vanity, vanity, all is vanity. But oh, beloved, there is great joy there in heaven. Revelation 21, 7 says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and will be, I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Oh, the son and the daughter of the king, the son and the daughter of the God of this universe. What legacy is ours waiting beyond the sun? And then there is a life blessed by the Savior, a legacy of a life lived for Jesus above the sun. My dad and I, living about a thousand miles apart, would call each other. He'd call me in the morning, I'd call him at night. And we'd always close off the night, and dad said, well, you know, son, I may not wake up in the morning. And I would always say, well, dad, that's true. But for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you wake up in the morning, that's a good thing. You're going to live for Jesus. If you die, that's a good thing. You're going to be with him. And there is a legacy of life. One day I got the call from the nurse. I walked in, I saw my little light beeping on my phone. I thought, uh-oh, and I went there, and the nurse said, I'm sorry, John, but your dad went to be with Jesus this morning. I said, he woke up in heaven, didn't he? You see, folks, that is our destination. This is not our home. We're just passing through. My treasures are laid up. Somewhere beyond the blue, oh, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, folks, we have a life beyond this world. There's a life blessed by the Savior. And then finally in verse 3, we see the contrast between the earthly and the eternal. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? What a statement. 
What a statement to put on a tombstone. What a statement to put on a statue that you have erected for yourself there in a park somewhere. What a, what a statement would be made to be placed upon something that this world would read. The earthly recognition of humanity, life lived under the sun, is based on fading remembrances. A recognition of passing existence. It emphasizes life's temporal nature. You can go to all these parks. About every park in Fort Wayne, you see a statue, don't you? One of the unique things about Fort Wayne is that every statue is a different person of the, which the name of the park. <laughs> you can go to Foster Park and find somebody else's statue there. Or you can go to Sweeney Park and find... Somebody else's statue there. What we see is this is a recognition of passing existence. At very best, if we recognize these people or understand who they are, many times you go and you don't know who they are. Years ago, back in the 50s, when my mom and dad first moved to Fort Wayne, my mother would walk me down to the park down there by Lake Avenue. And I remember as a young child, probably three years old, looking up and seeing that big statue of that, that man there in that park. I did not know who he was. I just thought, man, man must have done something good. Look at this, huh? But you see, it's temporary. It reminds us that he was here for a moment, but now he's gone. What's afterwards, folks? You see, we have to understand that this recognition of this world, statues and buildings and endowments and everything that this world gives us, your walk of fame, all of that is all temporary, and it reminds us that there is life beyond the sun. We see it's based on fading remembrances, and it's built on foolish realization. Well, what happens to one of these famous movie stars that dies and they start bringing out all their movies and they start showing them on TV or bringing them out and putting them on, on for advertisement for you to buy or putting them online so you can purchase them. And oh, it's their way, their silly way to have immortality for this person. But oh, beloved, there is a life beyond this world, a life beyond under the sun. There's a life that is going to be for all eternity, either in heaven or in hell. We see the world's attempt, their foolish realization of, in, of eternal life. And then finally, we see the eternal reward of heaven, life lived above the sun. It's based on our faith in Christ, by the way, folks. In verse 3, the Bible says, What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? The answer to that is simple, nothing. There is no profit. You're going to leave everything behind. Charles Swindoll once said, You never find a U-Haul behind a hearse. <laughs> I did see one time online where a guy buried himself in his Cadillac. I guess he thought he could take it with him. Doesn't drive very far. I guess you could just about do the best thing and shoot it off into space, huh? Who would have thought that, right? What happens to life under the sun if it's not based on faith in Christ? Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The very best you can do without Christ, folks, is life lived under the sun. Temporary. And then it's built on a foundation of Christ. Life above the sun is built on a foundation of Christ. Luke 6, 47, 48 says, Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug a deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. 
Oh, beloved, when we come to that moment, when we close our eyes in mortal slumber, you better hope that your life is built on the foundation of Christ. Because if it is not built on the foundation of God upon Christ, then that house will come crashing down. We see it's based on our faith in Christ. It's based on, built on the foundation of Christ. It is blessed forever in Christ. Romans, the fourth chapter, verse 7 and 8 says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Being saved is meaning that we're settling out of court. Meaning that we have received Christ and lo and behold, the price has been paid for our sin. The theme of Ecclesiastes is simple. Doesn't matter what we accumulate or even what we accomplish in life. If it is apart from God, then it is meaningless. You might say it's too late for me. But you see, it's never too late. You begin living for God now. You begin living for God. And beloved, you begin to have blessings on the other side in glory. The answer is found for this book to these questions. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? It is found in the last two verses of the book. So let's turn there. To Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Now you follow along as I read it out of the Amplified Bible. Verse 13, all have, has been heard. The end of the matter is fear God, which means to revere God. Know that he is, revere and worship him and keep his commandments for this is the whole of man the full original purpose of his creation, the object of God's providence, the root of character, the foundation of all happiness, the adjustment to all in harmonious circumstances and conditions under the sun, and the whole duty for every man. Verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it is good or evil. We see the answer is simple. Live for God. Oh, beloved, live for Jesus. Begin to put those blessings, put those trusts on the other side. Living a life under the sun is temporary, folks. <laughs> it's only for the here and now. But oh, if you live for the other side, if you live for the other side, it will be eternal. God has a purpose for your life. And that purpose is not to live under the sun, but to live above the sun. Let us pray. Our Father God, again, we thank you for this time you've given us, for the opportunity to be in your house. And oh, Father God, as we have come to this time and this opportunity, this time of decision when we need to make a decision for the Lord. Lord, let us purpose in our heart to live a life pleasing to you. That that life would be a life not under the sun, but a life above the sun. That we would live for the world yet to come. That we would live for life everlasting rather than the temporal. And that place which is governed by sin. And oh, Father God, let our hearts be made glad as we purpose in our life now from this day on to live a life beyond the sun. And Father God, if there be someone here today without Christ, or someone watching on Facebook or even on YouTube, that this would be their opportunity now to receive Christ as their Savior to begin that life above the sun, to begin that life of eternity. Help them to understand, Father God, that they are sinners born that way, that we all have been born sinners and we're all in the same boat. The boat is sinking. Death is coming. The wages of sin is death. 
And oh, Father God, we understand that Jesus is the Son of God and he came into this world to give his life for us. That he died for our sins, paid the debt, and rose from the dead to give us life everlasting. And if we would but believe that and invite him into the, our hearts, we could be saved. Let them pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I realize that I have sinned, and so I confess my sins, and I repent of my sins. And Jesus, I ask that you forgive me. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Come into my heart now and save my soul. And to the best of my ability, Jesus, I will live the rest of my life for you. Thank you, Lord. As we continue in prayer, Father God, speak to hearts today. Those who prayed that prayer, let them make it public. Let them talk to a friend, a family member, or someone and share what they did today. For those here today, Father, they might come forward and make a public profession of Christ. Whatever decision, Father, those you've, you've touched with their, their, in their hearts to pray, let them come and pray. Whatever decision, let it be done today. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Blessed be the tie that binds.